Well, it was in the uh, late part of uh, the summer, early fall of 1991, late October to pre be precise, uh, that a freak storm hit the New England coast. It came so suddenly, it didn't even initially have a name. And so the locals very quickly began to refer to it as the perfect storm. Even those who had lived in New England all their lives said it was hands down the worst storm they had ever seen. Three storm systems, including uh, the dreaded nor'easter and Hurricane Grace to the south, converged into one superstorm off the coast of Massachusetts. Generating wind gusts up to 120 miles an hour, waves that were between 30 and 60 feet high. Some say those waves uh, were closer to 100 feet high in spots. The damage to coastal towns was extensive. It, the damage was in the tens of millions of dollars. And, and this perfect storm took 13 lives, including the lives of the men who were on the Andrea Gale. Some of you may remember the George Clooney movie that came out, I think it was in 2000, by that name, The Perfect Storm. Well, Captain, Captain Billy Tyne uh, took out his 72-foot fishing trawler just a few weeks before uh, that perfect storm hit shore. He took out the Andrea Gale, his 72-foot fishing trawler, along with five other fishermen. They set out for the fishing waters off the coast of Newfoundland. It was a 900-mile trip one way, but they thought it was worth it because they had heard the fishing was incredible off the coast of Newfoundland, and they were correct. They went to Newfoundland, they cast out their nets, and they filled the whole of their fishing crawler with a quarter million dollars worth of fish. But on their way back, they got caught in the heart of the perfect storm. Well, there they were trying to battle through the waves and the wind, trying to make it back to shore, and it never happened. You see, the last words of Captain Billy, as he uh, was radioing for help out in the middle of the storm, he said, she's a coming on, boys, and she's coming on strong. The radio went dead. The search crews were soon thereafter sent out, and the Andrea Gale was never found along with its crew of six. And interestingly, the Andrea Gale, its last known coordinates were right around where the Titanic had sunk some 79 years earlier. Well, 1900 years earlier, a similar freak storm swept across the Mediterranean Sea. And just like the Andrea Gale, the ship caught in that storm also went down. But miraculously, not a single one of the 276 men on board died. Every one of them made it to shore safely, including the Apostle Paul. God had made him a promise that he would get to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in Rome, and nothing, absolutely nothing, was going to stop God from keeping that promise. Amen? not even the perfect storm. Well, when we left off two weeks ago, the Apostle Paul was being held as a prisoner uh, there in the city of Caesarea, the capital, uh, Roman capital city there in Judea. Paul had been there for two years, even though Governor Felix knew full well that Paul hadn't broken any Roman laws and Paul hadn't done anything to deserve imprisonment. He kept Paul in prison as a favor to the Jewish leaders who couldn't stand Paul. And we also read there in that chapter that he was hoping that Paul would bribe him, that he would slip him a little cold hard cash under the table to secure his release. Well, Paul refused to play Governor Felix's game. As we saw at the end of chapter 24, Governor Felix was replaced as governor of Judea by Governor Festus. And over the next two chapters, Paul was given the opportunity to present his defense and share his testimony with two powerful Roman leaders. First with Governor Festus there in chapter 25, and then with King Herod Agrippa II in Acts chapter 26. Remember what Paul said to King Agrippa 
after sharing his testimony of how Jesus had saved him and called him to be a witness for him. In Acts 26, verse 27, Jesus turned to the most powerful leader in the room, King Agrippa, and he asked him, Do you believe the prophets, King Agrippa? I know you do. In essence, Paul was saying, King Agrippa, you've read the Old Testament scriptures about the coming Messiah being a suffering Messiah. Do you believe those scriptures are true? King Agrippa, you've heard the testimonies about the miracles Jesus performed in Galilee. Do you believe those testimonies? You've listened to the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' resurrection that prove he was really alive. Do you believe these eyewitness testimonies? Do you believe them, King Agrippa? Do you believe them? I know you do. And we saw in verse 28, instead of answering Paul's question with a genuine, heartfelt answer, King Agrippa took the easy way out by asking a question of his own. Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? To which Paul responded, short time or long, I pray that God, not only you, would, but others listening to me today, may become what I am, except for these chains. Let me say that again. I skipped a few words in there. Short time or long, I pray God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. Well, I believe in that moment, the Spirit of Almighty God spoke to King Agrippa and told him, today is the day of salvation. Now is your opportunity. Well, he squandered that opportunity. He squandered that moment. Instead of asking the most important question he could have asked in that moment, the question being, what must I do to be saved? He stood up. He left the room. He had wasted that opportunity to get right with God. Well, chapter 26 ends with King Agrippa chatting with Governor Festus. King Agrippa tells him in no uncertain terms there at the end of chapter 26, this man, Paul, is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. He could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Well, Paul had appealed to Caesar, so the wheels were set in motion for him to be sent to the capital of the Roman Empire the imperial city itself, Rome, Italy. And that's where we pick up in verse 1 of Acts chapter 27. So make sure you're there with me, following along in your Bibles. Once again, Acts chapter 27, beginning in verse 1. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the imperial regiment. We boarded a ship from Andromitium, about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia. And we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so they might provide for his needs. From there we put out to sea again and passed to the Lee of Cyprus, because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Cilicia. We'll go ahead and stop there for now. I'd like to draw your attention to a few things in these verses. For starters, notice how pleasant the chapter begins in verse 1. It was decided that we would sail for Rome. Doesn't that sound nice? Doesn't that sound nice? We would sail for Italy. Remember where Caesarea was located. Caesarea was located on the east coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Now, where was Italy located? Italy, you may remember, is located on the north central coast of the Mediterranean Sea. So they're sailing from the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea to the north central coast of the Mediterranean Sea. I don't know about you, but that sounds to me like a Mediterranean cruise. (laughs) And they were on this little ship that would go from port to port along the coast of the Mediterranean. Well, 
That kind of reminds me of something, just taking a nice little cruise from port to port across the Mediterranean. Reminds me of a song. Just sit right back and you'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip that started from this tropic board aboard this tiny ship. Aristarchus was a mighty sailing man and Paul was brave and sure. Well, you get the idea. It started out nice enough and pleasant enough that first day, the journey was a dream. They traveled up the coast to Tyre. Let's look at the map here. It'll give us a, a better visual of what was going on. So they started down here in Caesarea uh, and they traveled up the coast in their little ship to Sidon. It was a 70 mile journey and they made it in one day. Easy smeezy, 70 mile trip, nicely up the coast. They get to Sidon. Hey guys, we've made good time so far. Let's hang out for a little while. Uh, that uh, centurion Julius allows Paul to spend some time hanging out on shore with his friends. They help to take care of his needs. And so there they were out of kindness to Paul, it says Julius allowed him to be with his friends there in the port city of Sidon. So Paul was not the only prisoner on the ship. We read a few more things there in those early verses of chapter 27. Look again at verse one. It says that they, these other prisoners were placed in Julius's care. Now these might have been Roman citizens who were unjustly accused like Paul and had petitioned to have their case heard before Caesar. So maybe they had appealed to Caesar like Paul had. Or these could have been more hardened criminals who had already been sentenced to die, but for some reason, they had been selected to be sent to the Roman Colosseum, to be killed in the Colosseum in the great fights that took place there. And so whether these were hardened criminals or others that had appealed to Caesar, we're not told. We're just told that there were other prisoners with him. We're also told that there were a couple other friends of Paul, traveling companions that accompanied him. Uh, first was Luke. Notice how that pronoun is used in verse 27. It says, we set out. Yeah, it was decided that we would sail for Italy. And so we know for sure that Luke, the writer of Acts, was traveling with Paul. He was probably allowed to do so because he was Paul's personal physician and Paul had health issues. And so they must have allowed Luke to go because he was there to tend to Paul's physical needs. Now, we don't know exactly why Aristarchus was allowed to go. That's a little bit interesting. Uh, but some say that Aristarchus must have been allowed to go because Aristarchus had chosen to become Paul's slave. Because we know that oftentimes in a situation like this, a prisoner would be allowed to have his slave with him. So imagine if that was the case. Aristarchus was so devoted to Paul that he chose to become his slave so that he could stay by his side. We don't know that for sure, but it's likely. One way or another, Paul with Aristarchus and also with Luke joined 273 others on the journey to Rome. Well, we notice, notice in this first leg of the journey, they went to Sidon, that was smooth sailing, but they were heading from Sidon. Their plan was to go south of Cyprus up to Myra, uh, there in that uh, region south of the province of Asia. And so that would have been the, the quick way to go. But you notice in the map, it shows them going north of Cyprus, and that's explained in those early verses here in chapter 27. They did that because the wind was against them. And so they had to go to, it says, the lee of the island of Cyprus. Lee is a nautical term, which means the downwind side. So evidently the wind was sweeping up from the west, maybe from the southwest or the northwest. And so they couldn't take their ship south of Cyprus. They didn't have a powered boat. Uh, they simply relied on the wind to take them where they needed to go. And so they had to drift north of Cyprus on the downwind side of the island and follow the coast there to Myra. So it took longer than they had anticipated. The first leg of their trip to, was about 70 miles. The second leg was about 500 miles. Well, once in Myra, the centurion went on the hunt for a more suitable ship to complete their journey to Rome. They needed a ship that was larger and more seaworthy. And we pick up here in verse 6 of Acts 27. Follow along. 
There was there the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off Snidus. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the Lee of Crete, opposite Salmone. We moved along the coast with great difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens near the town of Lycia. Much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was, about the fa- it was after the fast. So Paul warned them, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete, facing both southwest and northwest. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought they had obtained what they wanted. So they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Nor'easter swept down from the island. Hmm. Well, there in the port city of Myra, the centurion found just what he was looking for, a larger ship that was sailing for Italy. He had seen how that smaller ship had been driven by the wind, and he wanted something that he felt was a little more seaworthy. And so he found this ship that was hailing from Alexandria, Egypt. Now, historically, we know in those days that those ships would come up from Alexandria, Egypt to Italy filled with grain because Italy found most of its grain sources in Egypt. And so it was a lucrative trade for the Egyptians to send grain up to Italy because they, like Paul on the other ship, were dealing with simply the winds and having their sail driven by that. If we get this map back up here, you can see this. And so what they would do is from Egypt down here, they couldn't sail straight to Italy because the winds wouldn't allow them to. They would sail north to Myra or the vicinity of Myra. And then from there, they would follow the coast as best they could over to Italy to trade their grain. And so the centurion says, hey, this is a great idea. They're headed to Italy anyways. It's a larger ship. Let's board this grain ship heading uh, for Italy. And so that's what he did. He took all of his prisoners. I said a minute ago there were 276 total. We don't hear that number until later in the chapter. So most likely on that smaller ship that had Paul had begun his journey on, there weren't quite that many. But on the second ship, we know for a fact there were 276 people total on board, including the centurion, Paul and his two traveling companions, the other prisoners and sailors and anyone else who happened to be on that ship. Now, This centurion felt this ship uh, hailing out of Alexandria was more seaworthy. But that was just relative to what they considered seaworthy vessels in their day. So don't think that this was anything like the Queen Mary. Uh, Remember what you learned in elementary school about the Mayflower. You remember the Mayflower that took the pilgrims uh, all the way uh, to uh, New England uh, from Britain? And that was just an amazing thing, the Mayflower. And you may remember how stunned you were when you saw the pictures of the Mayflower and were told that 102 people were crammed onto that little ship. 102 men, women, and children were on that Mayflower. They made it all the way to New England and only one of those 102 people died along the way. It's remarkable that a ship powered simply by sails was able to make it all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. Well, I want you to think about this. The Mayflower was like Bill Gates' yacht compared to this ship that Paul would have been on. You know, this, this is a technological masterpiece compared to this grain ship that Paul would have been on. Here's a recreation of what the Roman grain ships looked like in Paul's day. It had one sail, that was it, one huge sail. So you can imagine how these ships were so easily uh, pulled by the wind because they didn't have multiple sails to manipulate. They had one big sail and it was basically like a wood barge uh, floating across the Mediterranean Sea. And so they thought it might be seaworthy, but by modern nautical standards, this thing was like a, a floating nightmare 
a, a floating junkyard, and some might even call it a floating graveyard, because you were literally taking your life into your hands by boarding a ship like this with any sort of foul weather. Well, Paul boarded this ship. He was forced to because the centurion said, this is a ship we're using, get on board. And so they get on board, they begin their journey, and the captain had planned on sailing his ship north of the island of Crete, but here's what happens. So he's trying to go north of Crete from Myra, but the wind starts to kick up even more fierce than it had before. And so they couldn't go north of the island. It takes them a long time to even get to the south of Cree. Once again, we read that word, they were on the lee of the island. That means, once again, they were on the downwind side. Because the wind was blowing uh, in a southerly direction, they couldn't stay north of Crete. And so they start traveling along that southern coast of Crete, and they stop and throw out the anchor at this piddly uh, little port town called Fair Haven. It wasn't even really a town. It was just a place where they could temporarily park their ship. And so they do that and they park it there. And in verse 10, Paul says, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But Paul is overruled. The captain and owner of the ship thought that the port at Fair Havens was too exposed of a harbor uh, to winter in, and there wasn't a good-sized town nearby, and he knew the sailors wanted to party all winter, and so, you know, there's not a good-sized town nearby. Tell you what, let's go ahead and see if we can sail 40 miles to the west to a better port town that's more protected from the winter storms and has a more thriving uh, town nearby, near that port. And so they decided they were gonna sail 40 miles to the port town of Phoenix. How hard could it be? You know, the ship had made it this far. Certainly it could travel another 40 miles up the coast. Well, let's pick up in verse 15. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Cauda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes under the ship itself to try to hold it together. Fearing that they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard and their own, with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night an angel of, the, of God, whose I am and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. Wow. As the perfect storm raged on for two weeks, you can imagine how much the, uh, the whole of the ship was creaking and groaning under the pressure. It was just made out of wood. Of course, it wasn't an iron or a steel ship. It was just wood planks. So it was certainly creaking and splintering under the pressure. It wasn't designed to withstand a storm half this strong. Planks were bending, splintering out. The crew released ropes into the water and looped them around the hull of the ship trying to help hold it together. You can imagine the, the bucket brigade was working 24-7, shoveling out all the buckets of water that were getting below deck. They didn't have a way to let out that water, and so they're probably shoveling water out constantly night and day. And I'm sure uh, after two weeks of this, as Luke writes here, everyone had lost hope. There were 276 people on board, and we know at least 275 of them had lost hope. 
But thankfully, there was a 276th man on board, and that was the Apostle Paul. He hadn't lost all hope. The Apostle Paul had an angel of God come to him at night, and that angel of God stood beside him and said in verse 24, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. Of course, Paul didn't keep this good news to himself. The next day he shared it with the rest of those on board. God had given him hope and Paul shared that hope with everyone around him. Amen? And we pick up in verse 27. Here's what we read. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea. When about midnight, the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again, found it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down from the sea into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Hey, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it fall away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow struck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping, but the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The next, or the rest, were to get there on planks or on pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land in safety. Well, as the bird flies, Malta is about 600 miles from Fairhavens. You can look on the map one last time. So there they were in Fairhavens. They had tried to travel 40 miles up the coast of Phoenix and they never made it. The wind kicked up and it forced them away from the island of Crete, somewhere into the south part of the Mediterranean Sea. And from Phoenix to where they ended up in Malta, it should have been about 600 miles, but in all likelihood, they had traveled over a thousand. Several weeks of time, bouncing up and down on the Mediterranean, not knowing where they were because they had no compass. They had no instrument to tell them uh, where they were, what direction they were heading. They couldn't tell because they couldn't see the stars at night and they had no compass. And so they just prayed to God. And because Paul was on that ship, and Paul had, made a, had been made a promise by God. They made it safely to the island of Malta sometime later. <laughs> what an amazing journey. There are so many wonderful insights and lessons we can pull from this incredible chapter. During a very stressful crisis, Paul showed himself to be a wise counselor and an encourager to everyone around him. And I really like how uh, Pastor Joseph Parker, who is an early 20th century pastor in, I believe, the area of England, uh, he said it this way. This is so good. He said, Paul began the voyage as a prisoner. He ended as the captain. <laughs> Isn't that a good description? You know, Paul began as a prisoner, but by the end of that journey, uh, they were listening to everything he said because they knew he was no ordinary man. Almighty God spoke to him, and they had better listen to what God was saying through Paul. 
Paul single-handedly saved those other 275 men because God was upon the Apostle Paul. Well, Paul's encouragement was really profound on this journey. Let me quickly share with you four ministries of encouragement before we look at our lessons to pull from today. Uh, These are wonderful ministries of encouragement that we can learn from the Apostle Paul in this chapter. First of all, Paul shared God's hope. We saw that in verses 22 through 26. You look at those verses again, verses 22 through 26, and you say, hey guys, you know, I know all hope seems to be lost, but an angel spoke to me and he has given me hope. Paul shared that hope with those on board. Isn't that awesome? That's what God has called us to do, to be messengers of hope. God has shared the message of hope in Jesus Christ with us and we've experienced that living hope as we've invited him into our lives. And in turn, we share that living hope with those around us. We find secondly in Paul's ministry of encouragement that he shared God's warning. Verses 27 through 32, a few of those yahoos tried to secretly release that lifeboat into the water and they were gonna climb down and get in that lifeboat and get out of there. And Paul makes it clear, hey guys, if you don't stay with the ship, if the 276 of us Don't stay together, all bets are off, and you're gonna die. God promised to keep us safe if we stick together. And so Paul shared God's warning. We need to stick together if we're gonna be benefactors of the promises of God. Number three in Paul's ministry of encouragement, he set a godly example. He ate, he said, guys, I not only believe God's word that we're gonna be okay and we can go ahead and eat now, I'm gonna demonstrate my faith by actually eating. Sometimes we talk the talk, but we don't walk the walk. Paul demonstrated he had a good example that the other men on the ship were able to follow. And then finally, number four in Paul's ministry of encouragement, Paul's presence saved them all. We discover that clearly in verses 39 through 44. Because Paul was on board and God had promised that he would make it to Rome, everyone else was safe as long as they stuck with Paul. If someone were to ask the question, would the other men on board, on board that, that ship, would they have perished if Paul hadn't been on board? And I really believe they would have. I believe every one of those men would have likely died in that storm had not Paul been on board. Isn't that really amazing to think about? Oftentimes, because you or I are present, lives are saved. God will save others for the sake of his one follower who's present in the group. That's pretty amazing. Well, let me quickly share with you four life lessons that we can draw from this passage. I pulled these four life lessons from uh, Pastor Warren Wearsby in his commentary on the book of Acts. I really haven't changed the wording. Uh, He worded these very well. These are powerful lessons. So in the words of Warren Wearsby, four life lessons that we can draw from this chapter. Number one, storms often come when we disobey the will of God. We sometimes suffer because of the unbelief of others. Isn't that true? In verse 10, Paul warned the ship's captain and centurion that disaster awaited them if they sailed on from fair havens. Luke doesn't tell us if God had revealed this to Paul or it was simply based on his experience because he had logged in a whole lot of nautical miles on ships on the Mediterranean Sea. So if this was just him speaking from experience, hey guys, I can tell by the weather, this is not gonna go well if we leave this port or if God had spoken to him, either way, he had divine wisdom and they ignored that divine wisdom. And as they ignored his divine wisdom, the captain and his crew suffered, the centurion and his soldiers suffered, the prisoners suffered, and the three innocent Christians on board suffered. All 276 men suffered because of the unbelief and disobedience of a few men. Now the same holds true today. In our families, in our workplaces, in our church, in our nation, storms come and many people suffer because of the disobedience and unbelief of a few. That's one of the reasons why it's critical for us as believers and followers of Jesus Christ to pray for our leaders. We need to pray for the head of our household to make godly decisions because our whole families can suffer if the head of our households disobeys God. We need to pray for our bosses at work because our workplaces could suffer 
if those, those bosses disobey God. We need to pray for our church leaders. We need to pray for our national leaders. It's imperative that we be praying for Governor Newsom and be praying for President, uh, uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris because if they do not make godly decisions, if they disobey God, all of us are going to suffer to one extent or another. The storms come when our leaders disobey God. So pray for your head of household. Pray for your boss. Pray for your principal. Pray for me and for our church leaders. Pray for our president. Pray for our governor. If they make rotten decisions, wicked decisions, we all suffer. Life lesson number two. Storms have a way of revealing character. Isn't that true? Storms have a way of revealing character. It's easy to trust God and serve Him with integrity when the sun is shining and the seas are calm. It's much harder to trust and serve Him when the ship we're sailing on is coming apart at the seams. But that's the best way to discover if your faith is real. That's the crucible where godly character is forged in fire. None of us like being scared half to death. None of us enjoy being in the middle of a miserable, painful storm where you're getting drenched and you're not eating enough food and you don't have any clean water and there's no hope that you can sense with your five senses. None of us like that. But that's where you're going to find who you really are. They're in the midst of that storm. Are you a committed follower of Christ or are you just a fair-weather Christian? Are you going to stay on the ship with Jesus? Or are you going to abandon ship when nobody else is watching? Life storms will show you and those around you what you're made of. Storms will reveal if you as a Christian are the real deal. Life lesson number three. Even the worst storms cannot hide the face of God or hinder the purpose of God. Isn't that good? Even the worst storms cannot hide the face of God or hinder the purposes of God. Even in the worst storm of their lives, God was clearly at work on that ship Paul was on. Every one of those 276 men on that ship, even the skeptics and the atheists, could see it. Paul and his traveling companions could see it. The crew could see it. The centurion and his soldiers could see it. And the other prisoners could see it. Even in the worst of storms, with the ship's hole creaking and the waves crashing and the hope fading, God was working all things together for good because someone on that ship loved God and was called according to his purpose. God had purposed to send Paul to Rome and no storm, not even the perfect storm, was going to keep God from fulfilling his promise and his purpose and his plan. What was going through the minds of those 275 other men as they crawled on, onto the Malta shore? Well, I believe among other things, they must have been thinking, the God of Paul is amazingly powerful. This God of Paul is incredibly strong, and he is a God who keeps his word no matter what. Finally, life lesson number four. Storms can give us opportunities to serve others and bear witness to Jesus Christ. Once again, storms can give us opportunities to serve others and bear witness to Jesus Christ. What a blessing. Most of the passengers on that ship probably wouldn't have given Paul the time of day if it had been smooth sailing to Rome. But their ears were wide open to what he had to say in the midst of the storm. The same holds true for you and me during our storms. I found over the years that people listen much more carefully to what I say at a funeral than they do at a wedding. It's true. During a crisis, during a storm, people around us will be much more open to you serving them, to me serving them, to listening to what we have to say. During a storm, people will be much more open to what you have to say about the hope you have in Jesus Christ. So let's not curse our trials. Let's accept them for what they are as opportunities to grow and to serve and to bear witness to the goodness of God and his son, Jesus Christ. 
Lord Jesus, I thank you for your faithfulness in Paul's life. You made him a promise, and even the perfect storm was not going to stop you from carrying out that promise. Those on the ship disobeyed Paul's good counsel, but you still carried out your good promise. No matter what nature or disobedient sinful men threw at Paul, nothing kept you from carrying out your purpose and plan for him. I thank you, Lord, that the same could be said about me and about each of us who follow you. Nothing will keep you from carrying out your purpose and plan for us as long as we follow your marching orders and stay in the center of your will. Help us like Paul, Lord, to be obedient to you during calm seas and in the midst of the worst storms. And help us, Lord, to share the hope we have in Christ. Help us to be obedient and walk obediently to your commands. And help us, God, to be able to be a powerful witness to those around us of the goodness of God. God, I love you. And I thank you for always working all things together for our good as we love you and carry out your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. This is an amazing story. Now, many have commented over the years that Acts chapter 27 reads like a ship's journal. Dr. Luke was no professional sailor, but he was on that ship documenting with such wonderful detail what took place in that voyage to Rome. And I, for one, am so thankful that he included this whole chapter in the book of Acts. He wanted us to know that the greatest storms in life will not keep God from fulfilling his plans and purposes. Amen? Amen. May God bless you as you walk in obedience to his commands and enjoy his purpose and plan in your life. And if you've never made a decision to accept Jesus as your Savior and Lord, I urge you to do that today. Please reach out to us by phone or by email. You can reach us at info at greaterimpact.cc or simply call us at 760-246-4100. Admit that you are a sinner. Believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and choose to put your life in his hands today. And he will lead you through any storm that comes your way. God bless you.